Hello, and welcome to Bear Necessities. My name is Bear, and today I want to give my opinion on the top 5 rating fundamentals in EverQuest 2. So without further ado, let's get started. Number 1. Understanding AoEs and dealing with them. There's a number of points I want to make on this subject, so let's just get started with target range. Quite a few raid encounters have AoEs, and a lot of these AoEs have limited ranges or hit for less at a further range. So how can you tell how far you are away from the mob? Well, we can turn this on by going to Options, User Interface, Name and Chat Bubbles, and check Show Distance to Target. Use this to ensure that you are getting out for AoEs if you're DPS, or if you're a healer, you're healing your tank from the maximum distance you can, so you'll overall take less damage from AoEs. Secondly, let's talk a little bit about mitigation. AoEs are damage just like everything else in the game, and all AoEs do specific types of damage. There are multiple damage types in the game, physical, noxious, magical, and elemental. Physical is crushing, slashing, piercing damage. Noxious is disease and poison. Magical is arcane and mental, and elemental is heat and cold. There's also focus damage, but you can't really mitigate that, so we'll ignore that. Since AoEs do these damage types, we can often mitigate the damage by increasing our resistance to those types of damage. For example, Troubadours get raid-wide elemental and arcane buffs, while Dirges get raid-wide noxious buffs. Furies get a raid-wide temp buff called Porcupine that increases all resistances. Lots of classes get buffs that increase resistances as well, like Priest and Mage power buffs that usually have a resistance modifier on them as well. Finally, there are certain classes that get wards against specific types of damage. For example, Wardens get an Elemental Ward, Templars get Arcane, and Mystics get Noxious. Third, let's talk a little bit about immunity. Unfortunately, sometimes AoEs hit too hard. While I personally think this is inherently a game design issue, it's often something we have to deal with in this game. If you mitigate and are at range, and an AoE is still killing you, then you can use something like AoE blockers, like Druids who have Tortoise Shell, which is a short range AoE immunity for the group, and Blade Dance, which is a barred AA buff that grates AoE immunity. Also, you can get Signets of Ethereal Form for a small amount of coin and some status. These provide AoE immunity as well. Finally, I do want to talk about ACT or Advanced Combat Tracker. I'll provide a link in the description below, but once you install it, it will take you through a wizard to set up the EQ2 plugin. In game, all you have to do is type slash log space on, and this will start pushing your chat logs out to a file. ACT reads this file and does all sorts of magic to track things for you. The most basic use of ACT is DPS tracking, however, you can set up fancy timers for things. One thing you will commonly see is AoE timers. These are important because if you know when an AoE is about to occur, you can react accordingly. Maybe your bard can use blade dance, or your druid can use tortoise shell, or porcupine to help block and mitigate the AoE. Or if it's a short range AoE, you can quickly back out or joust the AoE, and then get back in after it goes off. AoE timers are never perfect because there's often a bit of variance in AoE timers, but it can be a general guide to help for your survivability. Number two, debuffs. Mobs do a lot of damage, and debuffs are actually very important in this game. There are certain attributes on mobs that we can debuff to decrease that damage. First, just like any player characters in EQ2, every mob has a primary stat that affects how much damage they do. So if a mob is a wizard, they may use intelligence as their primary stat. Debuffing that primary stat will greatly reduce its damage. Secondly, mobs have attack speed and DPS mod. Both of these increase their auto attack damage and combat art damage, so reducing these will also greatly reduce its damage. Finally, there are a few other stats that are often reduced by certain classes. Things like strike through and AoE attack can be reduced by a select few, AoE radius and ability reuse, etc. All these things are a bit more pointed, but they're also very important for quite a few mobs. Number three, curing. This one seems pretty obvious, but I really wanna stress the importance of curing in raids. First, there are single target attacks and debuffs that are often put on your main tank. These can absolutely destroy a tank if not cured immediately. These can be things like dots, huge defensive debuffs, or control effects like stuns, stifles, etc. Secondly, AoEs. Often AoEs come with control effects or dot components that will kill your group if allowed to tick. Since this is the case, curing your group immediately is ideal. Let's take a little tangent here and talk about pre-curing. It's important to always have eyes on a raid bob if possible. AoEs often have cast timers, so you can actually watch the cast timer of the AoE 
and time your group cure so that as soon as the AoE hits, it gets immediately cured. This is actually really awesome with some AoEs that may control you, like root you, knock you back, etc. Because if the AoE doesn't interrupt your casting, the control effect will be immediately removed from your group. Finally, cross curing. There are times when an AoE will only hit specific people or a specific group. One example is Berserker Raid mobs have stunning roar. This will only stun the group that the mob is currently targeting, but it is a short duration stun. Cross group curing those healers in that group will allow the healers to ensure the tank stays up and gets the rest of the group unstunned as quickly as possible. Also a reminder, healers aren't the only ones that can cure. Mages can too. So mages stopping your DPS for half a second to cure a healer can 100% save your raid. Number four, cross group healing and rezzing. This is another one that seems pretty obvious, but it's actually something that requires a bit of work and concentration on the healers in your raid. Most of the time, healing within each group is self-sufficient, especially while just killing trash or something. But on nade mobs, sometimes your main tank will spike with damage. So it's important for healers outside the main tank group to use your hand heals to make sure those spikes don't kill the tank. Also, maybe a DPS grabs aggro. Having the reaction time to swap over and heal that DPS will keep things stable instead of the DPS dying and the mob rampaging through the raid. I also included rezzing here because it's a similar concept. Whenever someone dies, getting them up as soon as possible will ensure the mob stays properly debuffed and DPS consistently stays high, or tanks are able to get aggro back as soon as possible. Use good rezzes on tanks, rezzes without resurrection effects, while reserving your bad reses for DPS, support, or healers. Having a macro that informs your raid you are resing someone is 100% important. It's wasted effort for two to three people to try to res someone as only one res will land. Number five, use temporary or temp buffs efficiently. Almost every class gets temporary buffs that bolster themselves or the group. These buffs often have short duration and increase your effectiveness in a variety of ways. They can make you immune to different types of damage, they can increase your healing, increase your DPS, etc. However, determining when to use these buffs may be confusing, and to be honest, there's no straightforward answer as it's most likely depends on the situation. For example, if you're the main tank for your raid and everything is going great, heals seem stable, everyone's alive, and the mobs are debuffed well, it's often best to just pump out as much aggro and DPS as possible. However, maybe the mob puts up a buff like Rampage or uses an AoE and one of your healers die. So this is definitely a good time to put up one of those damage immunity temps. If you're a DPS and you have a raid zone on farm status, it's almost always best to use your DPS increase temps on cooldown. But if you only have one mob up and it's about to die, you probably shouldn't use that temp right away. A lot of this seems like common sense, right? But there are trickier scenarios. For example, maybe there's two big AoEs coming up because of the variance, they are going to actually hit almost at the same time. This may be a good time to use AoE immunity because two AoEs hitting back to back could cause unwanted deaths, and the next time the AoEs will be spread out so you can efficiently mitigate and heal through them. Maybe you have a big DPS buff for your group, but you know a set of adds are about to spawn and your group would get overall more DPS if you waited 5-10 to 10 seconds for the adds to pop. Then you use your DPS buff so that the adds die quicker. A lot of these scenarios take practice and learning the encounters you are fighting, but using these efficiently can be the difference between success and failure. I hope these fundamentals were helpful to newer raiders, and maybe there are some tidbits for veteran raiders as well. If you enjoy my content, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you later.